presentation of Dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore family's legacy of building the great state of Idaho. Coming up, his popular program has been on PBS for more than 20 years. So how does travel host Rick Steves produce his shows? Steves takes us on a tour of his career and shares travel tips next on Dialogue. Stay tuned. When I'm far from home, I become a cultural chameleon. In England, I actually fancy a spot of tea. Here in Germany, it's got to be sauerkraut, big pretzels, beautiful radishes, knuckle of pork, and a great big beer. Hello and welcome to Dialogue. I'm Marcia Franklin. You are just listening to Rick Steves, the host of the most popular travel show on PBS. Steves, who's been producing his program since 1991, started writing travel guides to Europe when he was just out of college. He then saw a need for a different kind of tour business, closer to the ground, with smaller groups and longer itineraries. Today, his company, located in his hometown of Edmonds, Washington, runs five to 600 tours a year, serving 15,000 customers. He's written more than 50 guides, and then, of course, there's Rick Steves Europe, his popular PBS travel show. Steves also hosts a weekly radio show. So how does he do it all, and what's the philosophy behind the brand? I spoke with Steves when he was in Boise in the fall of 2014. I started by asking him how he first got bitten by the travel bug. This obsession, as I understand it, with travel started quite young. Well, maybe it started a little rocky. Your parents took you abroad, right? Your dad was a, uh, worked in the area of pianos, mm -hmm. selling pianos, and so he yeah. took the family abroad to... Yeah, in 1969, I was 14 years old. My dad said, uh, my dad was a piano tuner. He started uh, importing pianos from Germany, the best pianos in the world. And he said, we're going to go to Germany, son, and see the piano factories. And I thought, Dad, this is a stupid idea didn't want to go to Germany. But I got over there and it, it was clear to me. It was a great, exciting thing to do. There was, I always think there's a different candy, different pop. I distinctly remember statuesque German women with hairy armpits, you know. And uh, for, it was just kind of a wonderland. And then I realized after a little while, I, I saw kids a couple of years older than me with their rucksacks and year rail passes. And I thought, I don't need my mom and dad for this. Europe can be my playground. So I traveled. I was a piano teacher. Kids wouldn't practice in the summer, so I thought, I'm not going to push that. I'll see you in September. I'm going to Europe. And I was learning from my mistakes, and I started uh, packaging those lessons I learned from my own mistakes into a lecture or a guidebook and was teaching other people. And uh, I'm doing the same thing 30, 35 years later. And uh, I've got 100 people that work with me in Seattle. I've got, I've got uh, technology beyond my wildest dreams to amplify our teaching. But what I do is still spend four months a year in Europe making mistakes, taking careful notes, when I get ripped off, I celebrate. They don't know who they ripped off. I'm going to learn that scam and put it <laughs> into the book. And this is what we do. We try to help Americans learn from my mistakes rather than their own so they can travel smoother and enjoy well, one thing know, that has changed the is best trip. One thing that has changed, obviously, is the cost. What, what did oh, yeah. you, you, yeah. you actually yeah. lived on, what, 250 a day or yeah. something back in Oh, those early those days. Times. Europe, Europe through the gutter, I've heard you That was what it was, it. yeah. <laughs> Europe through the gutter. And, you know, back then, Oh, you could sleep for a dollar a night in a youth hostel and live for the price of groceries. And a year rail pass for 10 weeks cost two or $300, you know. And it was so fun to travel in Europe. It's designed for travel. And e eat excess food from Oh, you, know, you could scavenge food all over the place. Yeah, I've got some funny stories about that. <laughs> but, uh, but today, you, you still have that same philosophy. And basically, the bottom line is not traveling cheap. The bottom line is having a vivid experience. And the interesting good news is, in so many ways, Marsha, the less you spend, the more you experience. And the irony is, the more you spend, the more you surround yourself with people who just want to keep you in the dark and take advantage of you, you know? And uh, I just really like breaking out of that little moat situation and find myself in places where I'm not part of the economy, but where I'm seen as part of the party, where people just are glad there's somebody from far away there. And, uh, any, anybody can do it. I, I make it really clear I'm not as sophisticated about this. I don't speak the languages. Uh, I just am uh, able to get out there and, and travel like a good temporary European. What I found interesting in researching this was when you, when you first started your tours and you, you had felt that there was a need for a different kind of tour. Right. A little bit closer to the ground, yeah. as you were just saying. Yeah. But you weren't well received by 
you know, travel agents and oh, no. other people, <laughs> that, you know, so true. couldn't get into yeah. the big expos, right? Yeah. Oh, you, I don't know. Yeah, that's an obscure little fact you found <laughs> somewhere. Yeah, I remember when I was a kid, it was a big thing for us to go to one of those travel shows, and you had to spend like $500 to rent a table, and then you could hand out your brochures. So I went to this travel show, and I said, I'd like to buy a table. And they said, what do you do? And I said, we teach people how to travel without needing a tour. Oops. And they said, not at this consumer travel show, you know. So, but uh, that's just kind of, uh, my first tours in Europe, uh, the first way I went to Europe was just escorting these uh, big bus tours. And I was just, got a bunch of people together, got a free trip. I noticed quite a few of them were women on those buses. Oh, yes. But, well, <laughs> before that even, uh, it was just normal crowd and I would go in yeah. and I realized these tours, these typical cheap tours that are still the same business plan today, they don't make any money on their initial cost. They just want to get you on the bus yeah. or get you on the cruise ship or whatever. And then they make money off of you selling you stuff and, and, s and organizing your sightseeing and getting kickbacks and tips. And I just thought from a tourist point of view, I'd rather pay up front and have the guide fully paid and on my side rather than not paid and having to scam his living off of me during my vacation. So that's kind of the foundation of our tour program way, way back. And then uh, also I didn't like 50 people on a 50 seat bus. I think it makes sense to have you know, 20 or 25 people on a 50 seat bus with the guide paid fully up front. So that kind of distinguishes us from, from our competition. And I've always preached the beauties of going on your own, but there's a lot of efficiency and economy in sharing a big vehicle and having an expert to sort through things and having somebody else do the driving. So, you know, that's the rationale of taking a tour. And true, in the old, in the old days, it was just women that signed up on my <laughs> tours. And I think that was because, you know, guys they, could go have an adventure right. and not feel either, that they're at risk. Uh, but uh, women would want to uh, have a small group, and then they could do the adventurous things without really being foolhardy. And am I mistaken, but I think that original tour that you put together, that 21-day tour or 22-day tour, yeah. is still on your yeah. schedule, right? Oh, it's our, we have 35 different itineraries, and that's our flagship itinerary, the best of Europe in three weeks. And, uh, and actually, it used to be 22 days, and all of my tours were 22 days. It's France in 22, Germany in 22. Europe in 22, Italy in 22, and my, I was on a one-man crusade to help Americans have a longer vacation. Well, yeah. And <laughs> my staff finally got me aside and said, Rick, if we're going to get serious about this tour business, we've got to accommodate the fact that Americans have the shortest vacation in the rich world. So now our best-selling tours are 12 or 14 or 15 days. Uh, How do you feel about that? Do you think uh, Americans should take longer to go? Oh, yeah. I mean, other year, people look at us and just shake their heads and go, what I know when I've been people? traveling, I found Australians, they're on the road oh, for yeah. like three months. Yeah, and Europeans, they all, they all get five weeks off, you know, and uh, we have to travel all the way over there. It's expensive to get there. We take three or four days to deal with jet lag, and then all of a sudden it's time to think about coming home. Uh, but that's our American way. I mean, we just, we just um, choose to have the shortest vacations in the rich world uh, and work ourselves into an early grave. So you're still spending... Four months in Europe yeah. researching I'm in a these? Rut. 30 years now. I've been going uh, four months a year, April and May in the Mediterranean. I go home in June, and then I go back uh, north of the Alps for July and August. So you're still finding new things to see? <gasps> yeah, I was just in uh, Gdansk, which is up in Poland. It's the big port in Poland where the first shot of World War II was fired. And where Lech Wałęsa. Lech Wałęsa was right yeah. there. I saw his office, and uh, uh, I just had a very emotional experience at the uh, shipyard where the Solidarity mm -hmm. be brought the beginning of the end of the Soviet Union. I have been going to Europe 100 days a year for 30 years and uh, have yet to get to a lot of great places. That's one of them. Europe, uh, you can never exhaust Europe of what it has to offer. And for me, that's great news because I'm still trying. <laughs> <laughs> and you, but you don't go, if people want to say, oh, I want to go to Rick Steves' store and s yeah. see Rick Steves, you don't. Yeah. Well, often go on, you go on some of them, right? Yeah, well, for 25 years I was guiding our tours. Now I've got 100 guides that do our Rick Steves tours. And we've got, as I said, 35 different itineraries. This last year we did five or 600 tours, about 15,000 people. And uh, for 25 years I was guiding them. For the last 10 years I realized my guides, who are normally specialists, uh, Europeans that speak the language or Americans that have married into that culture or whatever, and uh, I've decided to take the tours instead. So every year I take one of our tours. I sign up with a pseudonym. I do it just online like anybody else. I get letters from myself. It's kind of fun. <laughs> and then I surprise the group over there. And for me, it's a, as the, you know, the boss of the company, it's important for me to come at it like a consumer. And I just thoroughly enjoy taking one of the tours every year. So this last year, I took the granddaddy of our tours, that 21-day that Best of Europe tour, which I used to do four times in a row every summer. And it, you know, you can go back to Rome and Paris and hike in the Alps and, you know, go in the canals of Venice for the rest of your life. And I had a great time. It just never gets old. So business started around 1980 or so, mm -hmm. as I understand it. First guidebook, 1980. Yeah. 
and then around 1990-91 you got into the television yeah. aspect of it. Yeah. What what made you make that? Well, I had been working really hard teaching, giving my talks, and writing my guidebooks. And then around late 80s, there's a flurry of uh, independent TV producers that got me aside and said, we should make a public television series. You know, And I, I found this one group that seemed to really have their act together, and I joined them, and, and they got us started. And uh, that was 1990, I guess. And uh, I was with them for five or six years. And since then, after that, I was producing my own shows. And uh, now I've got a wonderful crew. And I spend 120 days a year in Europe. 80 of those days, two-thirds of the time is researching my guidebooks and working on my tours, and an accidental byproduct of all that research is coming up with material for the scripts, meeting people, finding experiences. When I find something for the guidebook, I, I just subconsciously think, good for TV or not good for TV. And if, when I have enough good for TV stuff, I put a script together and take the crew back. And every year I spend 40 days filming. It takes six days to shoot one of the half-hour shows you see here on Idaho Public Television. and. Uh, so there's no way to cut that down. We are scrambling every waking hour. When the sun's out, we're shooting, and we always could use more time. And if it rains, uh-oh. If, if it rains, <laughs> I would inside. say we, we have to work twice as hard for half as much. Yeah, you know? yeah. And, uh, it's a lean crew. It's just you, a producer, and a videographer. Yeah, right? we just have it's a crew of three. We're yeah. public television. We don't have a lot, right. a lot of money right. to blow. No, I and, understand uh, entirely. <laughs> yeah. So we can I understand sit in the car. And I empathize. We can turn on a dime. And in fact, I would have it no other way. I like the small crew. We all wear different. We all wear a number of hats. And uh, when, the, when the light's out, we're shooting. And when I'm so thankful for Simon, who's my producer, because he's a great traveler, and uh, he's a great producer. And he's over there for every minute. But then he's also in the editing suite with our editor at home. So he knows what's important to me. He knows what we got up early for and, and took that fisherman out for the shot of the sun rising over the harbor or whatever. And it, that gets in the show the way we intended it. Now, you get up early, as you say, first light. After after you get that nice last light, you're still writing in your hotel room. <laughs> yeah. um, where do you get the energy to do mm. this, to do your guidebooks, yeah. to do a radio show, to do all the appearances that you make? Uh, where does that come from? You know, I've been doing this for a long time. I'm in my late 50s, very late 50s. And when I work, I work for 60 days in a row over there without a break. And I come home feeling younger and healthier than when I left. And uh, I have to get my beauty rest. I got to get my seven or eight good hours of sleep a night. But other than that, uh, I'm I'm lucky. I found my niche. And every time I see people have to work in a situation where it's not their niche, I just feel very blessed that I was able to find something that really gives me energy instead of takes energy away from me. <laughs> but even your your crew is like, don't, well, don't give them another cup of coffee. <laughs> that's what they say. Yeah, they they. Uh, I have to remember that uh, I'm doing this because it's my it's my mission. That's why I'm here. Yeah. But uh, every uh, everybody, a lot of people are. But my crew works They'd very, work very really hard, hard as well. Yeah, they're, they're just they're joking. Just, they care about the, the mission. I mean, a big part of this is we're able to bring a better understanding of different cultures home to our country, and we're just so, I mean, it's right in public television. We couldn't do this elsewhere on the dial. What do you find to be the toughest about translating what you love and what you can write about in a mm -hmm. guidebook mm -hmm. to, to television? What's mm -hmm. the hardest? Is it is it the artwork? Is it um, finding people who are going to be open and want to talk with you on television, what's the... Television's a different animal than writing a guidebook. Uh, and my producer always reminds me, this is not a guidebook. And this is not a slideshow. See, I give PowerPoint presentations right. around. And, and it's got to be balanced and it's got to be, uh, there's got to be a, a nice flow and uh, tension and meadows and, uh, you know, and, and I want to pack as much content into the half hours I can, but there's a limit. Uh, so I get about 3,200 words for a half hour show. And, uh, seven pages or something? Seven pages on a script. And then uh, we take it home, and usually it ends up to be a 35-minute show, and I painfully have to cut out So the minutes. toughest thing is what you have to cut out, basically. That's, well, that's tough. And also recreating the magic. There's so much magic when you're traveling, and it's just never quite the same with a camera looking down on your shoulder when you're in the market having fun with somebody. There's all these incredible experiences that you have when you're, when you're swimming through those cultures. And... Okay, I'm swimming through this culture. It's so amazing. I'm coming back with the crew, and we'll swim again. But when we swim with the crew, it's it's never the same. So take it a, another take, another take. It's yeah, and it becomes a little more forced, and uh, it's the nature of television. It still can be beautiful, but it can't be quite the magic of actually being there yourself. So that's my my challenge, and and I, I just know so many Americans need to be freed to get go beyond Orlando and, and go beyond. Go beyond Waikiki, you know, and really hang out with people who see things differently. 
and you know find cultural things that are more exciting. I grew up thinking cheese is no big deal. It's orange in the shape of the bread. Here, cheese sandwich. And you go over there and they're evangelical about cheese. You know, I mean, the cheese shops are just a, a festival of mold. Uh, to, to bring the camera into there and to have the cheesemonger take a wad of cheese and go, oh, smell this cheese. It smells like the feet of angels. You know, to, to have that experience and then to bring the camera back and produce it for everybody to see at home. That's good tour guiding. And that's good TV production. Too bad we're not smell-o-vision yet. No. We're not, well, we're lucky we're not smell-o-vision because <laughs> I wear the same shirt for six days when I do the show. <laughs> Continuity. You gotta, Continuity. I don't want to have to think, what shirt were you wearing yesterday? Yeah, and that backpack. Tell me about that little rucksack Oh, that carry. rucksack. I always carry that. It's usually got, um, well, it's got sweater, lunch. Uh, it's got a battery or the scripts. And uh, it also, I get so excited when I'm talking about everything I love that my hands start going like this. So I anchor it here. And, uh, oh, okay. So you see me with my little bag as I'm running around. It's kind of my sidekick. Has anything uh, really funny happened to you on the road? <laughs> Humorous to you know, break it all up? Uh, yeah, nothing. Nothing, nothing overly. Nothing hilarious. It's just. Uh, it's uh, work. It's, it's what work. It is. It's yeah, work. it's. It's. I'm so. I get one shot at this. So I'm. I never look at the weather unless I'm filming because I need good weather to have everybody out and in a good mood and the colors popping and this sort of thing. Uh, and. Time and time again, when I'm looking at my work, whether it's writing a guidebook, making a tour, making a TV show, or even going on vacation, it's how good the trip is, is a function of how many people you're meeting. If I'm not meeting real people, not other tourists, not people who are camping out waiting to sell you postcards, but real locals. Not the lady in the dirndl that meets the travel writer at the airport that's going to show you all the cliches. Every year they invest in stuff, and then the travel writer or the TV producer comes in and they want you to show this casino or this resort. But I'm talking real people. Uh, if I can connect people to people in my travels, whether it's a guidebook, a tour, or a TV show, that's going to make it sparkle. And that's the mark of a good show. Other voices than just my own on the show. Do you ever worry about overexposing an area? I know you've teased the Cinque Terre. Yeah, <laughs> there's a handful of places you, like you, the Cinque Terre. You put that on the map, yeah. essentially. The Cinque Terre is five little towns like this, beautifully isolated in the most seductive stretch of the Italian Riviera. It's my job is to find these undiscovered places and then ruin them, you know. <laughs> uh, it sounds kind of harsh, but I mean, I'm a travel writer. I've worked long and hard to find these great places. I can't imagine discovering a place and keeping it a secret. On the other hand, if it can't handle the crowds or on the rare occasion if it doesn't want the crowds, I'm not going to write it up because um, it's only going to be as good as the reception is warm for my readers when they visit it. But we find in Europe nowadays these charming little places are often charming because they're backward and they're not as developed. And they are. Still. Yeah, and they're scrambling. This is the kind of discovery I love to feature in my guidebooks. It's a perfect back door. Almost no tourism, lots of history, and plenty of character. And then when, if we discover them, they morph then from a, a, a very humble town to a town with boutique hotels and nice little restaurants. And so you can have company. that effect. Your and books. I'll have that effect where I'm contributing to the economy while making it a little less charming from a classic you know, old world tourism point of view. Local people are very thankful for the bump in their business. The tourists are generally so thankful to go there. And then, frankly, the tourists want a comfortable hotel and a nice boutique, you know, restaurant or you've, something. You've seen that, that uh, you can attribute yeah. you writing or yeah. showing a TV program on a certain area to an increase yeah. in, in, in a handful of cases, yeah. And, and then interesting. And, and it's interesting for me to go back as a researcher because everybody is scamming to get in the book. And my big challenge is to see through that and find out what honestly is a good value for my readers. Not who's going to treat me like a king, but what's going to be good for uh, the other guy that comes a year later. Uh, it's very important f for you, it sounds like, yeah. to still be on the ground doing that research yourself. Oh, that's my then most, that's my favorite thing. I sourcing love it. it out. I don't, I've got a dozen people that research with me, but I wish I could do it all myself. I just really enjoy it. And I, that's for 80 days, two thirds of my time in Europe, I am alone with local guides usually. and knocking on doors and checking out things and checking out the gelato, checking out the, the vodka, checking out the politics, checking out the museums, checking out the B&Bs. You mentioned Gdansk. Are you finding then that still more of the undiscovered places are in Eastern Europe in or East? former yeah, Soviet you gotta go If you go south or east, you find things cheaper and a little more untouched and a little less developed and I think a little more exciting. On the other hand, if I want to sell books, I don't write a book to Poland, I write another book to Paris. So that's the odd thing for me in my business. I mean, I have to pay the bills. And much as I love Norway, 
my Scandinavia book is my worst selling book. It's a great book, but the market is small. And I, my Italy book sells piles. So and I heard it, you say once, and it was, it was uh, rather surprising to me and a little disappointing that a book about how disabled people can travel oh yeah, to these places right. is also not yet a well, big yeah. market. I put a lot of energy into writing a book called Easy Access Europe because I think it's an important thing. But the book sold in the hundreds, and it was great, and everybody who used it loved it. Um, but you just cannot stay in business doing that. You have to have some organization fund to that because it's a small market. You so know, and you just gotta if you're look if you're thinking about travel business, you gotta be thinking of what's the market. And the you know, right now my publisher just visited us and he's not saying make a book on Bulgaria. He's saying let's find another way to do Paris. But will you find some way to get that Gdansk experience in? Oh sure. We do it. In I mean I'm committed to covering all of Europe regardless of the You just wanna write sales. a book on no, we've got a book on Eastern Europe. Oh, you do? Okay. Yeah, and I've got a book on Scandinavia, and I spend way more time than I should making Scandinavia well, that's interesting. Your that's your <laughs> heritage, <laughs> that's heritage, heritage, isn't yeah. it? How do you stay healthy? Uh, get my sleep. That's the most important thing, and eat healthy. Uh, what I'm does out it mean to eat healthy? I mean eat healthy. Well, when you're a tour guide, everybody is constantly enjoying gelato and chocolate to die for, mm. and I'm beyond that. I don't. But do you avoid the vendors on the street? Like sometimes we're told to do, oh, and avoid salads it's and not, things No, there's not that concern. I mean, if you go to India or someplace right. or Africa, then you have right. to, how do you stay healthy? For me, in Europe, it's it's like, how do I stay healthy if I'm in the United so States? So it's the same, it's, it's everything take is... Take good care of yourself, get your sleep and eat, eat mm -hmm. smartly. Um, if I, yeah, the um, the main thing for me is to sleep well. If I if I get a cold coming on, I, I just sleep it off. But and I your tip on jet lag may, is, is, what, to stay up? <laughs> stay, well, yeah, you gotta stay up to a local yeah. bedtime, and then, yeah. and then you need to, uh, Flip your wristwatch ahead and your your psychology ahead, so you're really in that local time, and then y usually within a couple of days you're you're good. But you should be functioning on the first day. It's just important to remember jet lag hates bright light, fresh air, and exercise. So get out there. I love to do a, an outdoor walk or something like that on the first evening in Europe, and then uh, in fact I'm when I'm working, I my first night in Europe I'm out looking at restaurants because that's one of my favorite things to do is assess the restaurants. And I just give myself that responsibility so that I finally get home at 10, 10.30 and I'm just beat and I go right to sleep and then I'm back on European time. Uh, that's a good tip. We, we have time for a few more. Uh, mm -hmm. How should people keep themselves safe when they travel, particularly if they're traveling alone and not in yeah. a group? Well, the safety issue really is petty purse snatchings and pickpocketings. You're not gonna get mugged and there's no terrorism. I mean, in Europe, we're talking now. In Europe, yeah. yeah. Um, generally, but where there's tourism, you're safe. Now, the typical American is very bad at assessing risk. You know, yeah, and in Turkey, when I was there, yeah. it was a little. Yeah, well, I Turkey, found Turkey some risks is there. Turkey feels dangerous to some people because the people are not as well scrubbed by our standards. Oh no, I mean, I actually had an experience, so it can't happen. Yeah. Oh, yeah. it can happen. Sure, yeah. you just need to be. Um, you got to realize we're very rich compared to the people in the streets in a lot of countries. And it's a thief will target Americans. Not because they're mean, but because they're smart. It's just so common So keep everything sense. in a money belt? And Put it in a money belt or zip it up or leave it at the hotel. Uh, and walk in places that are well lit and populated. And I know one of the things that's very important to you and you insist for people who go on your tours is that you pack light. Yes. And that's pretty small. What, what well, do you require? Well, 9 by 22 by 14. 9 that's by 22. By 14. 14. That's a carry on the airplane size bag. Now, most of these bags, there's, they're all over the place. We design them. That's a very popular bag. I live out of this bag for four months out of the year. I spent a third of my adult life living out of a Your carry on airplane size bag. Your company designs the bags. Okay. Yeah. And uh, people can learn about all of our stuff at ricksteves.com. But uh, there's, you know, these bags are all over the place. And uh, it's just a good self imposed limit. I mentioned we take 15,000 people on our tours every year. Most of these people are. Um, just like you and me, I mean, they're not like a bunch of uh, kids running around or anything, and, and none of them are allowed to take any more than this much luggage, and for a lot of people, that's a radical concept. What, nine by 22 by 14, that was my cosmetics kit, but I say that's everything, and it's a sort of tough love, but they're always thankful they packed light, and uh, I've never checked a bag. I mean, I just carry with a carry-on bag, even with my wardrobe and my writing gear and my laptop and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I just am fanatic about being mobile. You're not gonna find, if you're on a budget and you don't want to carry your bag, uh, uh, it doesn't add up. You know, People are going to take advantage of you. I just think you're much more, and whether it's a wheelie bag or a bag on your back, it doesn't matter. You just really need to be mobile. The philosophy, um, Marcia, is that you're not living off the land up in the mountains. I mean, you, you don't have to take it from home. 
you are going over there and when you need something you can right. buy it. You don't need to, Americans tend to pack for the worst scenario and I would say pack for the best scenario. And if you need an umbrella, buy it over there. You know, if you if you gotta get uh, mittens, go into a department store. It's a fun opportunity to, to go shopping in a different country. Um, but the, the key is to be mobile. And to remember the less you spend, the more you experience. And also a very important point is using um, your, your time smartly as well as your money. You know, we always think of our money, but always also think of using your time. For instance, a lot of people waste a lot of precious vacation time standing in needless mu lines at museums. And uh, in my book research, my guidebook research, one of my challenges and passions is to find every line that can be befuddle a tourist and find a way to get around that line at the Louvre or the Orsay or, or the Rijksmuseum or Anne Frank's house or, or the Eiffel Tower. At every great site in Europe where there's a long line, there's a way to get around it. You just got to know how. These days you can make reservations in advance. You can buy a museum pass that lets you go directly to the uh, front, uh, or you can avoid it on certain days when it's the only thing that's open. And we talked about this in the main program, but I think it bears repeating. Um, get out of your comfort zone a little bit. Maybe yeah. go someplace that isn't on the beaten path. You know, not, Why not put yourself in a huge amount of danger, but. Yeah. Uh, there's, I, I've, danger. I've been in Egypt, I've been in Israel, Palestine, Turkey, and Russia in the last year. And my loved ones there, do you think this is safe? And I tell them, as long as I'm not going through Chicago, I think I'll be just fine, you know? I mean, statistically, Chicago is dangerous. You go to LA, that's dangerous. You go to Istanbul, the danger is you're gonna step on a, on a nail or you're gonna, uh, uh, somebody's gonna grab your camera. But nobody's gonna shoot you or knife you or mug you. That's the important thing to learn. And uh, I, would, I would say there's nothing more exciting than getting out of your comfort zone where you are no longer the norm. I think you've called it rearranging the cultural furniture. That's right. Very That's interesting a beautiful phrase. Thing. It humbles your ethnocentricity. And uh, we're, we're out of time, but I just want to say your son is following in your footsteps or yeah. your Yeah, uh, Andy C. suitcases. He's got a, Andy's got his own tour program for students making three-day weekends when they're over there on their foreign study programs. And that's an exciting little niche that he's found. Great. Well, wonderful. Thanks so much for taking some additional time to talk about how you put your programs together. Oh, this has been a delight, and I'm so thankful to have uh, Idaho Public Television to share my TV shows, and we've got a lot of travel coming up, I can promise you that. All right. Well, thanks so much. You've been listening to travel host Rick Steves from PBS. I'm Marcia Franklin. Thanks for tuning in. For more information on Rick Steves or to watch this program again, check out the Dialogue website. Just go to IdahoPTV.org and click on Dialogue. Presentation of Dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore family's legacy of building the great state of Idaho.